It's my great pleasure to introduce Larry Smarr, a person I have known and admired for many years. Larry, uh, probably more than any single individual, was responsible for getting NSF into the supercomputing business in the first place and then creating an excellent instance of a national resource uh, at the University of Illinois, the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. More recently, he was lured to California to become the founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, which is engaged in an enormous array of, of partnerships and projects. He also holds a professorship in computer science and engineering at San Diego. Um, he is um, principal investigator on numerous uh, funded projects, the Optiputer, um, the Greenlight Project, and um, a very interesting project called Camera, being funded by the Moore Foundation. So I've asked Larry to give you his perspective on the technology and application for the future and also to serve as kind of a consultant critiquer uh, of what we're about, and he'll make some comments wearing that hat in the, in the concluding session. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Larry Smarr. <coughs> Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. Uh, Michigan has always been uh, one of the leaders that we can count on in the country, uh, going back to the beginnings of the internet. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, I think you are really, an, at, at this point, uh, with all of the people that are signed up here, I go around the country to a lot of these cyber infrastructure days, and I don't think I've ever seen this many people uh, at one of these events. So I think, I think you're actually at a tipping point of being able to move very rapidly into a leader, national leadership position on uh, what I'm going to talk about today is high performance cyber infrastructure. And, and the reason that we need to have something other than the shared internet is this tsunami of data that is coming from not just the people doing supercomputing, which is what it used to be, which is a tiny fraction of the people uh, uh, on the campus, but all your digital instruments, all your gene sequencers, <laughs> DNA arrays, mass specs, uh, microscopes, are generating a order terabytes a day. And the problem is that the shared internet is a wonderful thing. It's one of the most incredible inventions humans have ever achieved. Uh, you know, it's scaled up over now uh, almost 40 years, uh, but it is engineered for megabyte or smaller objects. If somebody sends you a 10 megabyte attachment on your email, there's not a lot of hope of getting it, right? Um, but what you as scientists deal with, our researchers, is gigabyte. That's a thousand megabytes, or terabytes, that's a million megabytes. Now, you know, as I said this morning, pythons have a certain elasticity, right? You can even get a pig through a python, but try putting an elephant through one, okay? There's a limit, and so the, the shared internet is great, and we'll keep using it forever for web browsing and social networks and email, but it is not an appropriate engineered solution for the problem at hand, which is what you're all here about. Um, to give you an example, uh, you know, I was on the advisory committee of the last three NASA administrators, and so I was uh, very involved in, in, among other things, the Earth satellites. Um, and this is just one of those uh, uh, ISAT that um, they have for each of these instruments, uh, the data is at Goddard, and then they measure every day the throughput to the universities trying to download the data. Well. It's a bit of an eye strain, but I just downloaded this today. Here's October 28th, 31st, November 3rd. And if you can see, these are in megabits per second. So Colorado State's getting upwards of 100 megabits a second, but Texas is down here at 20, right? And although this one is hardwired in, essentially, it's, you can see it's up to 300. Right up here at MIT, MIT is getting only 40 or 50. So the throughput, what this is a way of telling you, is the throughput of data over the shared internet is of order 10 to 100 megabits a second. Well, why is that a problem? Well, how many times have we heard terabyte today, right? It, it takes 10 days 
if your FTP session will stay up for 10 days, right, to move a terabyte across, that's a 10 megabit speed. It only takes 15 minutes if you're on a 10 gigabit, which is what we'll be talking about. 10 gigabits is 10,000 megabits a second. Now, is there a scientific justification for building such an infrastructure? Well, uh, are some of you hooked up to CERN here? I know that this is, you've got a, a great set of people here in the physics department doing this. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this, this is, I'm not going to belabor this, but, you know, th this is a six gigabit continuous stream, uh, 250,000 jobs a day, and this is probably out of date, for just one tiny fraction of the physics community that happens to do high energy physics. The next great shared planetary uh, instrument like the LHC is now being competed, uh, the finalists are uh, Australia and South Africa, for the, what's called the square kilometer array that will build this vast array of radio telescopes. I pulled this down from the engineering specs on this instrument. What does it take to make this instrument work? Well, I'll highlight it here. The long haul links are two terabits a second. Two million megabits a second. The short haul are 80 gigabits a second, eight times what I'm talking about. And the requirement for the winning team is you have to be able to move a terabyte image worldwide every minute. Remember I said 10 gigabits, it takes you 15 minutes. So the worldwide network that they're thinking about is obviously more 100 gigabits, right? We just had a three-day uh, symposium on, the, on just what, like what you're talking about here at San Diego, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is a sister center to Cal IT2 at UCSD, uh, on grand challenges in data-intensive science. And I won't go through the details, but the main point um, is that petabyte supercomput petascale supercomputing generates terabyte data sets. So for instance, here's turbulence. And this is a subject that you can see goes back at least till 1972, so you know, a full decade and some before the NSF supercomputer centers, um, in which they're just trying to do this one thing, one periodic, I mean, obviously you can do full three-dimensional turbulence and everything else, but just this one problem of one, you know, one dimensional, um, one periodicity in one direction. And you just look at the size here that's uh, uh, grown uh, a factor um, of 100 from 30 megabytes up to 40 gigabytes uh, just in the 80, period from 1988 to 2010. That is, after you've done the computing, you end up with the data that you want to analyze, and that's in that sort of size frame. Now, they're doing these wonderful things I thought I'd never live long enough to see, which is accurate simulations of earthquakes using the very detailed earth structure, um, the uh, just incredibly complex um, simulation, and we were fortunate enough to get uh, Tom Jordan, who's one of the world's experts on this, to give this talk at the meeting I was at. And you can see they're doing uh, 5 million CPU hour runs. I remind you there are 8,000 hours in a year, right? So if you're doing 5 million CPU hours, you're doing it highly parallel. Um, to get enough cores, you can see 4,000 cores on, on Ranger at Texas, 189 million jobs to produce this map of Southern California as to where the earthquake threats are. And even though, you know, I'll give you that you don't necessarily want to analyze the whole output, that's 165 terabytes, but the archived data is two terabytes. Climate change, here's a uh, if Ricky, I don't know if Ricky Root is, I think he's teaching class, but you know, you've got one of the great experts here at Michigan. Um, and as we move to these petascale, what you're seeing is to do these runs, beginning to get enough resolution that you can actually believe uh, accurately the results, you're talking about 100 times the current climate models in terms of production. Uh, which means you're producing, again, uh, a terabyte a day. And I won't go into the gene sequencers directly here, but
but your next generation gene sequencers are typically producing a terabyte a day. So it seems to me that there's a clear cross-disciplinary need for a high-performance cyber infrastructure to handle the generation of data that modern science uh, requires us to look at. So what are the subcomponents? And this is what I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. And we'll start with the backplane. If you, it, here's the way I guess I've come to think about this. And this was the fundamental thing that led to the Opticomputer project. If your backplane of your local cluster is, say, let's just call it 10 gigabits a second, and you're connected to the rest of the world through the shared internet at 10 megabits a second, there's a thousand to one mismatch between the wide area and what you can do locally. And so what do you do? You stay local. And so it's not just that we have 100 or 200 research universities that are digital islands. Every faculty laboratory on each of those universities is a digital island. And so if we can't get this solved so that we have, a, that's why I call it let my data free, throw down the walls of the prisons and let the data roam where it needs to go to get the work done, okay? Particularly as we go to collaborative teams across the world. It's fortunate enough that the natural bandwidth along one of the infrared wavelengths on a fiber optic is 10 gigabits a second. So other than artificial cost that the telephone companies have put, made up to make themselves rich, it, sorry about that, guys, out there in webcast land, but um, <laughs> I'm going to regret that statement later, I can tell. <laughs> but honestly, that's the problem. I mean, from an engineering point of view, for the first time in history, we can do this. We can make it so that anywhere on Earth, we can flow at those kind of speeds, 10,000 megabits a second. So then if we can do that, instead of 10 megabits a second, you're getting 10,000 megabits a second, you better have a good size bucket in your lab to take 1,000 times more bits every second, and to, you better have some compute to be able to work on it, and you better get rid of the visual bottleneck to be able to analyze it, right? So we'll talk about that, and then since at these levels of computation and storage, none of us have enough scientific knowledge to solve the problem. You need a multidisciplinary team. And so how do we get collaboration? How do we get this wide area cyber infrastructure? But then how do we finally deal with the real bottleneck, which is the campus itself, which does not have this installed in most campuses? Now, a lot of people say, you know, it's like in Oliver. You know, no child ever asks for more. You know, surely the shared internet, it's good enough for email. Surely it'd be good enough for science, right? Um, why should our scientists be pampered, you know? Um, well, I happen to work closely with Australia, uh, and I helped convince them to do this very courageous act they did to create the National Broadband Network, which is connecting now 93% of all premises in a country that's the same land area as the United States, not counting Alaska or Hawaii, um, it starts at 100 megabits per second and then goes straight to a gigabit because the copper that we're all using for cable or DSL is at the end of its life. Remember, it's gone from 300 baud, 300 bits per second, to 30 million bits. That's a good run. But it's at the top of the S-curve. The glass starts. <laughs> right, at, at, at gigabits, and it's got many orders of magnitude to go. Uh, the rest will be covered with satellite, uh, and then this provides, the government is doing this. This is radical. I mean, in this country, you know, it would be like, there he goes again, you know, Obama's going to socialize the whole country. Well, <laughs> don't get me started. Anyway, um, you know, actually, in our Constitution, we talk about the canals. We talk about the post office. You know, we actually say the United States government has a role in building a common infrastructure for the social good. And Australia actually took this seriously. And so uh, they committed to the largest infrastructure project in their history. 
$43 billion. Now, $43 billion, I know, in an age of uh, collapse of the financial sector doesn't sound like much. But remember, there's only one-twelfth as many people in Australia as the U.S. So if you, if you scale it up, it would be $700 billion. Okay? And they're doing it, and we're, of course, putting $7 billion in as part of our stimulus. And here's the map. So this is universal coverage. Well, again, this is something I don't think people get. Fiber to the home is already 130 million households around the world. It's mostly in Asia. And it's growing at 30% a year. Now, if a gigabit is what a couch potato gets, why aren't our scientists good enough for a gigabit. So with that thought, over the last decade, many of us in innovation centers around the world have been working collectively together to create this map, which is a gigabit, 10 gigabit uh, fiber link uh, under the oceans and connecting uh, institutes around the world called the Global Lambda Integrated Facility. Just had their meeting actually in CERN a few weeks ago. And in the United States, this includes the NLR and the Internet 2 and so forth. Um, and so the, one of the first things we did with the Optiputer project, which is now finished, but it started about eight years ago, is we said, okay, we have to figure out what the termination device is. So, you know, your cell phone terminates the data flow, which is a few hundred kilobits over the wireless Internet just fine. It's engineered to be, you know, right, good for that. This PC is just fine for 10 megabits a second. So you have to figure out, what do you do? Well, fortunately, we noticed most of the with it researchers had clusters, and so they had only forgotten to buy the LCDs when they bought the PCs to make their cluster. Remember the network, they remember the PCs, but said, you know, fortunately, we can save the money, which was hardly anything, on the LCDs. So we said, no, no, what you want to do is put these together into making a large pixel real estate, and then... Uh, really bright people at the Electronic Visualization Lab and, and, and uh, another group at, uh, at Cal IT2 developed the essentially windowing system to make these so that you can have high definition videos coming in, you can look at hundreds of million pixel images, and you can do everything interactively as fast or faster than you do with your own PC. Now people don't like the fact that because this is the end reason people make LCDs and they always have these borders around them, that interferes with seeing things. But finally, in the last year, they're beginning to do uh, close to seamless. So now it's just seven millimeters glass to glass uh, for these walls. So we've got versions of this. And we have a wiki up that has all of the instructions of how to do this. And several hundred of these have been made. There's three or four here on this campus alone. Um, and you can then do them in full three-dimensional head track stereo. Uh, this is the next cave that we just did for uh, KAUST in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 22 and a half million pixels in full head track dynamic stereo. Um, you can then take the fact that you can link even commercial like Polycom or Life Size, Tanberg, uh, into this. Uh, we, of course, go up much further to uh, from a million or so like the life size, a couple million bits per second. We go all the way up to 1,500 uh, megabits uh, per second um, for uncompressed HD. But in any case, this is us working uh, on a uh, very, this is a 300 million pixel wall. Uh, you're looking right here at 1 million pixels, okay? Um, so it's 300 times that. And uh, here is a, this, this wall is, um, showing a single HD video stream of NASA Ames, so from Southern California, Northern California, and this is Larry Edwards, who's an investigator at the Lunar Science Institute, and then this is a wall they built, and so that picture is at Mountain View, and you notice he's the same size, right? So, so this is not your talking head VCR, right? This is, it's like dissolving that wall with a wall in another room somewhere else in the world, and now it's one mixed vi virtual physical space, right? And that means you can collaborate not with sharing your PowerPoints, but actually the visualization of the data that we started talking about that you've got, right? Now, you're fortunate in that you have the best group in the country, if not the world, in the study of how people collaborate scientifically and you've been doing it for several decades. And Dan is, is one of the folks 
uh, involve Eric. I don't know if Eric made it back or not, but he's uh, on, on the road. I just talked with uh, several other folks here. Um, and, and so this is the kind of stuff they're doing to get the hyper-detailed understanding of how people work in this environment. Um, uh, Michigan has been a great collaborator with us and with the EVL. Here you see the sort of high end of doing this, which is that these are full um, HD video streams from, uh, this is a picture taken in San Diego. Okay, that's Jason Lee, who actually happens to be the director of this data flow coming from the EVL at, at University of Illinois Chicago. Here uh, are your folks at um, University of Michigan. And this is a 4K, which is four times HD. Uh, so each frame is 4,000 by 2,000 pixels, eight megapixels per frame. Uh, and you'll notice that they're all replicated. So remember the access grid, which was multicast? Well, this is called visual casting. And a couple of years ago uh, at uh, supercomputing, almost exactly two years ago, we did this with, uh, again, Michigan was a, a key player in this. Uh, this requires a clear 10 gigabit pipe to everybody. And here's the bandwidth. This is 10 gigabits, 15 gigabits, 20 gigabits, and this is each one minute, right? So this is over like half an hour or more. And the sustained throughput is above 10 gigabits. Right? So when people tell me, uh, ten, you're crazy, Larry, like nobody could fill a 10 gigabit, I said, nobody. That would mean you, right? Not nobody. So I'll show you now a number of examples of this, of where people are beginning to use this. So here's an example of using, um, this is Mike Norman's work, uh, who's now the director of SDSC, on the uh, evolution, as you can see, of the entire universe. So at least a very large cube of the universe that's two billion light years uh, on a side. Now this is a huge simulation uh, at uh, Oak Ridge on one of the NSF TerraGrid machines, Kraken, over 16,000 cores. The output, the movie output is 148 terabytes. <laughs> the movie, not the data, right? And, and that's a quarter of a terabyte per file um, and so I um, was on the DOE Advanced Scientific Adv uh, Computing Advisory Committee, where I'll be actually next Monday and Tuesday at Argonne, and uh, a year ago, and, uh, or more than a year, a year and a half ago, and I, and I was being briefed on the ESnet being upgraded from 10 gigabit to 100 gigabit. And I said, that's great. <laughs> so given that 10 gigabit is yesterday's news, you must have a lot of examples of the end users of DOE supercomputers that have end-to-end -end 10 gigabits into their lab, tell me those success stories. Zero. Goose egg. Zero. And, and the reason is, again, it's nobody's job. Their job is to make sure that campus border router to campus border router is going at 10 gigabits or going at 100, and they do a fabulous job. It's not, it's not their job, and it's not anybody, as far as I can tell, in this country's job to actually connect an end user. <laughs> now think about this. If you put that kind of capital investment into a computer and you didn't remember to attach a user to it, <laughs> but somehow in networking, for reasons in decades in the field, I still don't understand. This is a normal way of thinking. So I challenged Mike, I said, Mike, you've got a five million CPU hour run there. Let's use you as a model. And I knew that because I chose him, of course, Malice of Forethought because SDSC has got great people uh, and uh, they worked with all these people, all these groups you see at the bottom, Livermore and, and uh, Oak Ridge and um, Argonne and so forth. And so what they ended up with is Here's the logical way it should happen. If you've got millions of SUs, millions of CPU hours on, on a supercomputer, then you want to flow the data as it is computing, because it may take days or weeks, right? So each time you get a new cube of the universe, 
you want to ship that off to a rendering site. Well, the rendering site happens to be halfway across the county, uh, the country in Argonne. And that's a giant GPU farm like you heard this morning uh, about here, uh, 200 NVIDIA cards. And then you want to ship that to your OptiPortal, which uh, Mike had made his own OptiPortal for his group, and then you want to be able to visualize it. Now that was a year ago that we got that to work. Now we have a worked example of an end-to-end -end user, 10 gigabit visualization supercomputer. But it was all batched. And so just when I was giving this talk last week at the San Diego Supercomputer Center uh, workshop, um, uh, it turned out that Rick Wagner, who worked with Mike to make this happen, told me he now has this working interactively. So he's got real-time volume rendering streaming from Argonne to San Diego under control. So instead of the command line driven, he's now got it. You can interactively rotate, pan, zoom. Uh, it's, a G, it's just a GUI that works essentially with any browser. You can manipulate the colors and opacity and, and do it all in real time. So this is the way it should be. That's why we built these things. But it's not the way that people are using them because it hasn't been built into the cyber infrastructure. However, because people are now beginning to get these lessons, as we look into building the cyber infrastructure for future instruments, it is beginning to be put in. And this is why I think as you begin to build your cyber infrastructure, you have this opportunity to build this sort of thinking into it. So one of the largest instruments uh, that NSF is supporting is this next uh, several decades of ocean observatories, both coastal, fiber optics down to the sea, um, and uh, global buoys. Uh, we were fortunate enough at Cal IT2 to get the, to win the proposal to uh, design the cyber infrastructure for that, uh, all those instruments. Uh, we're hiring somewhere between 30 and 40 software engineers to actually execute. This is the largest cyber infrastructure project NSF has ever funded for anything and should form the core of an NSF-wide common cyber infrastructure across disciplines, which Dan uh, valiantly argued for, for, and here he is back, uh, and it's still not happening, but I mean, I think it will happen yet. Now, this is a big wiring diagram. Don't worry about it. This is this is the cyber infrastructure diagram for the Ocean Observatory, but let me just point a few things out. It's built on private virtual 10 gig layer two networks, okay? It involves commercial clouds, as well as, of course, the TerraGrid, right? And so this is already past design review, and this is what will be built. So if we look to the future, this is, this is definitely the way it's gonna happen. Now, we heard, I was, unfortunately wasn't here for the talk on the cloud because I was I'd been put in other meetings, but clouds are emerging. They're not here yet, and they're, they're beginning to happen. And so one of the things that we thought about is, well, of course, most of the cloud work is going over 10, gig, uh, 10 megabit, just shared internet. Um, but and if you can't put the cloud on these 10 gigabits, you can't make it a part of this high performance. So what if you did? And, and I worked with Amazon and was able to get 10 gigabit uh, peering paths into Amazon uh, EC2 computing and S3 storage services. Uh, and we have a couple of uh, experiments underway. There's a national scale um, open cloud uh, test bed that uh, built on a 10 gigabit infrastructure that does uh, Hadoop and a lot of the things that Jimmy was talking about in his keynote today. And, and this is Bob Grossman, who was at University of Illinois at Chicago, now at University of Chicago. Um, and it, he's won the bandwidth challenge several years in a row at supercomputing. And these racks, so think about this. There's a rack at John Hopkins, rack at uh, Cal IT2, rack in Illinois, and it's all, com all connected with this 10 gigabit. So say you have data across uh, these uh, this is like doing what Jimmy was saying the hard way. So in other words, instead of having the data in one place where you can do the computing, let's, let's just separate the data because actually that's the way it's generated and see if we can't just do the same thing, that, in this case a terrace sort, um, across the country. Okay? And how much overhead is it going to cost us to have to move back and forth and synchronize and all that? And what Grossman has shown, if you can, I don't know if you can read this, but this is five gigabits a second. These are sustained rates, six, 6 6.8 gigabits a second, total aggregate uh, bandwidth, 18 uh, gigabits per second, uh, and the overhead is less than 5%. Uh, 
So this, this is the clearest example I have of that uh, once you make the wide area bandwidth equal to the local area clusters which are being connected, then it doesn't matter other than there is the speed of light latency. But as a relativist, I can tell you that light can get around this planet seven times in a second. So there is a, it's not as bad as you might think. Um, okay, so, and this again is more details than you want, but just to show you that there's a whole lot of things now where Grossman has been moving uh, virtual machines from uh, Illinois into the Amazon cloud. And this is a log, lo uh, log plot here where he's going from, uh, in bytes, here's a megabyte here, and this is the throughput in megabits per second down to like 10 or something. So if you're up to a megabyte, like I said, uh, shared internet works fine. But as you move up to uh, here, 100 times that, uh, and then here, basically 1,000 times that, so you're up to a gigabyte, now you're up at a good fraction of a gigabit, right? Logical, but here is a measurement of it. Uh, people say, well, you know, I'm a HPC kind of person, and so I gotta have a tightly coupled cluster to work on, and those Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Yahoo guys just buy one U uh, pizza boxes and put them in racks, and they don't have high uh, performance networks tying them together, so I can't work there. Well, that's an interesting hypothesis. Let's test it. Might be true, might not be true. And so here we've taken a climate code, an ocean modeling code, um, and put it in EC2. It's been running on a dedicated cluster at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And it runs a little slower because they don't have that kind of backlink. But if you go to TerraGrid and try to run something, you get in a queue. And the only thing you care about is the wall clock turnaround time. And so if this is a little slower, but elastic, as Jimmy was saying, the cloud, that's the whole point to the cloud. You need the cycles, you got the cycles now. Okay? Then even though it's a bit slower in the cloud compared to having to wait in the queue to get your turn to compute, it's faster. And the human only cares about wall clock time. Um, and now Phil Papadopoulos has been doing some really interesting stuff. You know, a lot of clusters use rocks to uh, enable them to just put in a disk and then it automatically puts up all the Red Hat Linux and loads all the software for the entire cluster, about a thousand of these uh, clusters out there. Uh, he's now got uh, things that allow the cluster to sort of extend itself on demand into the cloud when you need more cycles automatically, okay? And here we are working on a biology uh, Poisson uh, Boltzmann solver uh, as an example. And again, I won't go into the details, but just say these are the kind of things that are beginning to happen. Namely, that computing is going to be all over the place. So you're going to have local clusters, you're going to have campus clusters. UC System has shared clusters for all 10 campuses. You're going to have remote TerraGrid. You're going to have multiple commercial clouds. And that should just work as one thing. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about is, okay, so what do we have to do on our campus to take advantage of this for each of you individually in your lab? Not going across the campus to some center or something else. How can we do this in your lab? Well, we spent a couple of years at UC San Diego studying this. It was a group that uh, Mike Norman and Phil Papadopoulos chaired, it was under the vice chancellor for research, and it had to be approved by the chancellor, so it was seen as strategic. This was a strategic planning exercise because all of your research is going digital. And if we haven't been building out ahead of you the infrastructure on the campus to allow you to continue to you know, follow the exponentials up as the data gets bigger and bigger, you're going to become less and less competitive with the campuses that are doing that. And that's why Dan is, you know, dedicating himself uh, along with the rest of the campus to trying to figure this out. So we have this uh, report. Uh, Dan's uh, pulled it down and looked at it, uh, shared it, and so forth. And um, because we felt that it was, having gone through this several years of having faculty and staff tying in the library, the campus networking people, uh, faculty leaders from the medical school, from the general campus, from Scripps, um, SDSC, Cal IT2, right? So you've been going through this process, right? 
So here's the way I like to say it. This is an engineering issue. You've got to plug in your campus to something, which is a regional optical network, CIC here, I presume, although you have some individual fiber links as well. Now that has three different layers. The layer three is the packet switched uh, shared internet. Layer two is when you can have just your own private, if you want to think of it as an ethernet channel, uh, or you can have your own dedicated 10 gigabit path, or layer one where you have the raw fiber. So those are available. Okay, and so the question is, how do you get from where you are to the campus border router that this plugs into? Now, we were fortunate enough after the Optiputer to get an NSF um, uh, MRI, a, a, a research infrastructure grant for a couple of million dollars, to answer this question at UCSD. And so what we did was we said, okay, we'll make a three-level network. The, we'll put a router in, but then for, for like the layer three stuff, but then we'll put in a 64 by 64 MIMS optical switch. So this is like those 1950s patch panels for the telephone system. So, so a light beam comes in here, and instead of taking that light beam out of the light, de putting it into electrons, putting it into computers, then putting it back in the photons, which is what routers do, okay, with all the problems that that is, uh, leads to, you just bounce the light off a mirror, and these little MIMS mirrors on a 64 by 64 array can just, it's like a railroad switch yard for photons, okay? And then Lucent came up, Alcatel Lucent, with a way to actually take these, these parallel light paths on a fiber, just like, think of it as like a radio station with different radio, different, they're just different infrared wavelengths of the, of the lasers, and you can take this channel and flip it over into this channel, okay? So you have complete control now between moving your light paths, uh, packetizing it, whatever you want. We built out uh, 60 of these 10 gigabit paths across the campus. The switch itself is about a half a terabit per second switch in the basement of Cal IT2, or first floor of Cal IT2, and it's this hybrid packet lambda circuit switch that you can, each individual at the ends of those pipes can decide on the fly, this moment in time, I want to use it this way, and the next moment I want to use it that way. It's all under software control. So with that in place, the study said, okay, what we're going to do is if you look across the campus, you've got all these digital foxholes that, how many of you have clusters, you know, in your physics closet or chemistry closet or whatever, right? 186, 186 digital foxholes. Okay. So what you do is you say, let's invert the campus and in fact, I like to say it's a digital aquifer. Imagine under the quad, I don't know if you have a quad or not, but I mean, imagine metaphorically under the quad, you have this aquifer of petabytes of rotating storage. It's all automatically replicated and, and so forth. That's the center, the data oasis, it's called it, San Diego. It's linked in to the, all these 10 gigabits, Scenic, NLR, Internet 2 and then internationally into Glyph. And then everything hangs off of that. So the op local optiportal walls, campus, if there's a reason to keep your cluster. If not, there's empty racks that you can put your cluster in instead of having to run it yourself. There's a shared compute node on campus. <coughs> All the scientific instruments uh, need uh, have to uh, have a place in the wall to put the the optical fiber, so you want the optical fiber into your gene sequencer or your microscope or whatever. Uh, the library has its digital collections, uh, and then we'll talk about Gordon in a second. Furthermore, the main reason that the campus is doing this is it's going to be greener. It's going to use less electricity, and while you personally aren't paying for the electricity and the heating and cooling because that's a campus-wide thing, that, those costs are going like this. And so somewhere it's eating your lunch, right? And, and so we have another uh, MRI, which is called Greenlight, which is looking at how can we do this with much less energy, okay? And so that's an integral part of it. Now, I'll just give you an example of what's driving this. Each of these is a center that's been competitively won at um, UCSD in the biomedical area. And those are each driving, just like you have a, a several here, um, 
that are quite natural actual partners in this. Uh, and so I'll just take one, camera, which is this big uh, Gordon and Betty Moore grant that I'm PI for. And so this is to take microbial metagenomics, which means the genomics, bacteria occur all over the world. So, you know, humans kind of like think they run the place. Uh, well, for every one of your cells on this planet, there are 100 million bacteria for each of those cells. So get over it. It's a microbial planet, okay? We're just fluff. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a good thing to think about when you're meditating. It, we're fluff. So um, they asked us if we would build what became a global center for sharing all of this microbial data because the important thing is to compare your genomes of the bacteria's uh, DNA and its environmental uh, uh, variables with everybody else's. And so we built this 512 processor supercomputer and plunked it on the data. Okay, and got a bunch of sun thumpers and, um, for storage over here. And then we put a 10 gigabit optical switch. So you can link into this either through the shared internet or through a dedicated 10 gigabit. And we now have over 4,000 users from 90 countries that are plunking away, including, by the way, uh, some very large users here at the University of Michigan. However, as, this, as we've gone from a few users to 4,000, we're running out of cycles. And so what we've said is, okay, how can we spill over into the cloud? Wouldn't it be better to turn that server into an instantaneous front end to the cloud? So everybody gets instant turnaround, okay? And so we're now starting to do this with the Triton resource as well as with Amazon. So the Triton is the, is the shared um, computing and storage resource for the campus. Now, people tell me, um, well, that's fine for you, Larry. You got millions of dollars. How are we going to ever afford something like that? And you know, these 10 gigabits must be very expensive. Well, five years ago they were. It cost eighty thousand dollars for our quartzite project per 10 gigabit port. That's not deployable. Now, because of Andy Beckelsheim's invention of uh, this new thing called Arista, it's down to four hundred bucks, right? And so you could easily have an Arista switch, and you ought to have one on this campus, that essentially allows you to do this 10 gigabit switching at $400 a port. And so what, that's what we've done. Um, and you can see here's the Arista, and these are the number of 10 gigabit paths that we're taking into Gordon, which I'll mention in a minute as your data supercomputer. Uh, Dash is an early version of it and so forth. Triton is, is the shared storage. Um, going over into the existing storage. And so you have all of these 10 gigabit paths going through this single Arista. But um, what you want to be able to do then is analyze the data. And so NSF has just, uh, uh, SDSC just won a track two supercomputer called Gordon. It'll be there next summer. And look at, look at these numbers. This thing has two terabytes of RAM, okay, and then it's got a quarter of a petabyte of flash memory, like it's in your iPod, <laughs> okay, as an SSD. And so for each of these two terabytes of RAM, you've got eight terabytes of SSD, and then the whole thing has a four petabyte disk storage on it. So you're able to go from disk, which is 100 times slower than memory, to flash, which is 10 times slower to memory, to memory. So you can sort of flow the data into this thing and this means you could take like the entire output of one of your gene sequencers and put it in memory. Well, memory runs 100 times faster than if you're disk I.O. limited, right? So this is going to accelerate a lot of science. And of course, with the 10 gigabit connection with Michigan, your local environment, your lab, can appear to have Gordon on the backplane of your local little cluster, right? So where we're, where we're going, this is my last slide, is a new high-performance cyber infrastructure I call an opti-platform in which you've got end-to-end -end 10 gigabits, a light path cloud, if you like, um, that connects, you plug into it all your high-definition video conferencing, your, your digital cinema, your clusters, your, your, your opti-portals, your scientific instruments. It does require a campus optical switch, as we've discussed, to, and, and the optical paths, but other than that, everything else is already built. 
So this is the, the vision. Uh, it's mostly put in place everything except on the campuses. But a few campuses are beginning to do this. I would love to see Michigan be one of the pioneers in this area and work with us. So I'll stop there. You can download this talk from my live streaming portal um, where, like Jimmy, I tweet, uh, as well as have all of my presentations and videos and everything else. Thank you. Brian. Right. No, no, no. No, it, it, it's, it's really, and the fact that you have spent, the reason that, that I say Michigan is at a tipping point is that you have invested the last couple of years in getting the consensus. The fact that all of you are here, that, that's a lot of work that you can now build on, right? And so because the instruments, the, 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 it's really in the last year that these next generation sequencers have sort of tipped it meaning you have now decentralized data generation at terabyte per day all over the place. And to do the biology and the medicine, you have to have the results of all your colleagues in all the omics, the genomics, the proteomics, the cell networks, the imaging, to figure out the biomedical because we're an animal in a population of animals that is genetically derived from a population bottleneck 100,000 years ago, and so it's with, the, with the, that information from all of our bodies that we're going to be able to figure out how we work and therefore how to uh, improve our health. So I think that's why, to me, biomedical, I'm a physicist. I love astronomy. I love particle physics. I love all of this stuff. We can learn from those communities, but I think the tidal wave is biomedical informatics which Brian is one of the great experts on. So you didn't say anything about um, federated identity management and what it means in the infrastructure and management area. So there's a lot I didn't, the, the question is, I didn't mention uh, federated uh, repositories, authentication, uh, uh, identity management, and, and, and so forth. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole set of middleware that sits over this high-performance cyber infrastructure, which would be another hour or two of discussion. Um, and my only advice there is almost all of that has been developed with the idea that the substructure it's running on is shared Internet. And so you want to make sure that you haven't inadvertently limited the ability to reuse all that middleware that's been being developed in the grid and, and, and many of the other things that Dan has helped drive uh, when he was at OCI, uh, so that it can also work on the dedicated 10 gigabits. Because it, these are going to, the dedicated 10 gigabits are on the same fiber that the shared internet that all of you are using every day for your email and web browsing and everything. And so, and so you, how crazy would it be that you'd have to have a separate set of middleware when are, physically the paths are all on the same fiber? So, but this is fairly new, and so architecturally, I don't think people have been thinking so much about this kind of hybrid environment, but it's pretty easy once you start thinking about it. And again, the campuses that move first. The campuses that are pioneers will be the ones who work this out. And so my feeling is what you're going to see is a number of early adopting campuses 
that will partner up with each other, share best practices, and basically define the way for the rest of them. More questions? Here's one. Yes. So the question is, how do you um, fund the, the last mile? Well, fortunately, it's, it's not the last mile. It's the last 100 feet. So on most campuses, including Michigan, you have a lot of fiber in the ground. But typically, the way that fiber has been deployed is to the manhole cover outside of your building. I don't know how many buildings at Michigan have fiber deployed throughout the building so that when I go to the wall, you see all these plugs here? They bring electricity in. They bring shared internet in. I don't see any plugs on the wall bringing fiber paths in, optical paths, right? So that's where we're going next. And so, of course, you don't want to just set out to wire up your whole campus. You want to identify some pioneering researchers who are already at the point of dealing with these kind of massive data sets out of this group here today, that should be pretty clear who they are, and then say, hey, let's go to your building, get this hooked up, and let's learn together how we live in this, this world of high-performance cyber infrastructure. Okay, I'm going to propose, we're going to take a 10-minute break. You can come up and talk to Larry one-on-one. -on -one. And then uh, please stay for the final session where we really want to get feedback from you and help us with making some decisions about where we go from here. So let's uh, all thank Larry for a terrific Thanks. Thanks.